If you have your Bible, you can open up to Matthew chapter 16, and we'll get started uh, there. There are all kinds of things in life that I know nothing about. There is all kinds of things in this world that I am totally ignorant of. And you're like, oh, pastor, we know, right? <laughs> like, I don't have a clue how spawning salmon can find their way back to the exact stream that they were born in. I don't, I don't have a clue about how bitcoins work. <laughs> like, I, I really, really wish I did. But I don't have a clue. Right? I can't even figure out how it is that in my own house we have a laundry basket that is half filled with almost a hundred socks that have no matching pair. <laughs> like I'm, I'm not even exaggerating, like 87 socks that have no, like I can understand how you might have three or four. How does that happen? Where do they go? I have no clue. There is a whole bunch of stuff in life that I don't know anything about. But there's one thing that I know a lot about. And that's me. I know me, because I've thought about me lots, I spent a lot of time with me, I've spent all my time with me, I know me. I don't know what your favorite ice cream is, but I know what mine is. I don't know who your first crush was on, I know who my first crush was on. It was the genie from I Dream a Genie. <laughs> When I was six, I was totally infatuated with her, just a little bit of, and how do I know that? It was because I know me. I know me. And for the most part, I like me. And even those parts that I don't like, they get me thinking more about me. Like, how can I be better? How can I change? How can I be smarter? How can I be stronger? Or at the bare minimum, how can I hide those parts from you so that you will like me more? Because as much as I like me, I want you to like me as well. In fact, I wish you would spend less time thinking about you and more time thinking about me. Because I loom large in my life. Larger than anything else, larger than anyone else is where I loom. And the same is true for you. We live our lives thinking that, that life is a movie about us. Where we're the main character and everybody else has these kind of stand-in parts. And we want people to stop watching their movie and start watching our movie so maybe they'll give us you know, some Oscar nods and some thumbs up. So we try to you know, put the best character on screen that we can. We want people to like us because we're so fixated with us. We just need to stop and acknowledge that there is an incredible, powerful force in you that pulls you into you. That pulls your gaze on you. And it's equally true for all of us. And I know it's true because if, if somebody handed you an old group photograph, who is the first person you look for? Who is the person that you stare the longest at? It's you. Because nobody looms larger in your mind than you. We have a strong propensity to be preoccupied with ourselves. And, and then along comes Jesus. And Jesus says, if you live a self-centered life, if you make your life all about you, you will lose yourself. I would say, what? It's, it's like a, a shot of cold water right in my face. Jesus gets right eye to eye with me and he says, he says to me, if you fixate on you, you will lose you. And at this moment, in those words, we see this fault line open up between how we live our lives and the gravity and the energy that we put in that drives how we shape our lives and this very, very different picture that Jesus is giving. Now, I've called this mini-series that we're doing Fault Lines of Faith because, because a fault line is a place where, where two tectonic plates come together, where, where two forces that have an incredible amount of power, they meet. And so at the fault line, at a place where these two plates meet, can be a place of great instability, but it can be a place of great power, power that can shake, power that can shape a life. Now, if Wikipedia is true, big if, but if Wikipedia is true, what happens typically at fault lines is that you've got two plates that are moving together, both have incredible mass, both have incredible force, and what happens is that one plate gives way to the other. One plate gets pushed down over the other, and one gets thrust up 
into the sky. In fact, all these mounds around us were created by that same incredible collision that, that pushed up one plate. And we ski down and we hike it and we enjoy it. Now, I, I want you to, to, to use that metaphor, to hold that image in your mind, because I want to apply that to us, to, to you, to me, because Jesus exposes this fault line where we are standing on right now, where this, this picture that we have in our culture and in our mind of what the good life looks like crashes into this very different picture that Jesus gives. His words put me off balance. Because they're the exact opposite of what everything else and everybody else is saying. And, and, and so over the next three weeks, I, I want to look at, at three forces in your life and mine. Three powers, three tectonic plates, if you will, that are continually crashing into Jesus' vision for your life. But I want you to see how much momentum and mass they have. And, and at this fault line, this meeting of plates can be met. The coordinates of this fault line can be found in three simple words. Me, mine, and more. Me, mine, and more. These three little words mark the place where Jesus' vision for your life is, is either pushed down and buried under this enormous weight of individualism, materialism, or consumerism, or this becomes a place where, where your relationship with God is actually thrust up above your life, where it towers over the rest of your life the way the mountains, the Rocky Mountains, tower over the prairies. Well, that brings us to Matthew chapter 16. And it brings us to a guy named Simon. Now, if you're, you are new or, or, or newer to church, Simon is a friend of Jesus. He was a, a fisherman. He was a blue-collar guy. He was a business guy doing his own thing. And, and Jesus comes along and, and invites Simon into his life. Says, Simon, why don't you come with me? I've got something bigger and better for your life and mine for your life in my mind than what you have in yours. And Simon agrees. He accepts. And this invitation would change everything for, for Simon. He has no idea where it will take him at this point. He has no idea how it will change him. He doesn't know that Jesus is going to bring him right to the fault line, right to the pre precipice of these two powerful tectonic plates of self that are vying for shaping and control of his life. But, but we'll get there. Simon accepts, he follows Jesus, and he sees some amazing things. He sees that, that people whose life intersect with Jesus, they're, they're changed. Like, like people who are sick. I mean, people who are really sick with, with like horrible disfiguring diseases like leprosy. People who nobody touched, nobody came near because they were so afraid that they would catch it. Jesus comes close to them and he touches them. And he doesn't get sick. And even more amazing is they get better. Simon saw that with his own eyes. He saw that, that Jesus seemed to possess this power that he could control something as untamable as the wind and the weather. I mean, he saw it undeniable with his eyes. He heard Jesus speak. And as Jesus would speak, he would speak in a way that would just set Simon's imagination alight with, with images of God so bold and beautiful that years later, Peter would write that, that angels, they want to look into those things that I saw. And maybe even greater than all that, maybe even greater than everything he saw and everything he heard was, was Jesus made Simon feel like, like he mattered to God. Like God wasn't aloof or, or distant, just the opposite. Jesus was like this magnifying glass that was able to, to condense all the light and love of God, to condense it and focus it right onto Simon. You see, Simon was this man who, who experienced the incredible weight and momentum of Jesus' life pushing into his own. Until Jesus brings him to the fault line. To this incredible place of decision where, where Simon is going to have to make a decision on self. The decision on the me that loomed large in Simon's mind. 
Now, this is going to take place while they're on a road trip. Jesus takes his friends out of town. They, they go up north to this place called Caesarea Philippi, which is interestingly up in the mountains. And so that's a good place to get out of town, which is why some of you guys are here, is because you want to get out of town, you want to come to the mountains, and so you're here. Good to have you. Um, so while they're away, Jesus starts having a conversation with his friends, and he, and he, says, he says, what are people around town saying about me? Like, what's the talk in the lunchroom about me? And so his friends, his disciples say, well, they're not sure what to make of you, Jesus. Some think that you're John the Baptist reincarnated. Some think that you're Elijah. Right? That, that character from, from their Sunday school stories who was able to do miracles like they saw Jesus doing. Some think that you're one of the prophets come back. That the point is, is that they didn't know what to make of Jesus. And so they're seeing this life that they can't quite figure out. So they're looking back through the pages of history, trying to find something that they could relate and identify him with. Then Jesus makes this question a whole lot more personal. And he says, he says who, who do you guys think I am? Now I imagine it, it's quiet for a bit. And I imagine they're kind of looking at each other and looking down and not wanting to make eye contact with Jesus because you don't want to get this wrong. Like, you're like you know, you don't want to blow. This is like, you know, I mean, we ask kids here, what's the answer? And what's, what's the answer they always say? Jesus. Like, like they, even they can get it right. So, so you don't want to blow this question. And nobody's speaking. And, and in my mind, Peter, Simon, steps up and he begins to speak, of course, because he's kind of become the de facto leader of the group, the mouthpiece for the group. And he says this. He says, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. What, what is he saying? He's saying, you have no peer. You're brand new. You are utterly unique. Because you're the one, you're the one we've been waiting for. You are the one who God has promised will push history forward. That's who you are. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you're right. And then he says something amazing, which is where I kind of want to camp for the rest of our time this morning. He says this. He says, blessed are you, Simon, Son of Jonah, I tell you that you are now Peter, Petros, rock. You're the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, I, I love this verse for a whole bunch of reasons. But one of the reasons why I love this is that in this verse, I see Jesus affirm Peter's individualism. Peter, you're unique. You've got a unique story. You've got unique gifts. You've got a unique role to play. So I'm giving you a unique, special name. And I love it because it reveals this incredible truth. This truth that we take for granted, but this truth that was revolutionary in Jesus' day. And the truth is this, that God sees us as individuals, deals with us as individuals, calls us as individuals. The Messiah sees Simon as an individual, calls him by his unique name, invites him into a unique role, which is revolutionary. You see, up until this time, if you know any of the story of God's people, up until this time, God dealt with his people, the nation of Israel, as a nation. So, you know, what happened to part of the nation, what happened to the nation happened to everybody in the nation. It didn't matter whether you were good or bad, whether you were righteous or wicked, by and large, what happened to the nation, everybody had the same consequence. If the nation prospered and God blessed it, everybody prospered, even the shyster. And if the nation was being disciplined and they were sent into captivity like God did in 586 to Babylonia, even the righteous Jeremiah packed his bags and went into slavery. Because at that time, God dealt in big, broad brushstrokes with his people. But that's all about to change. No longer would the masses of people, would they come to the te temple to meet with God with some people in the cheap seats way, way, way back trying to get a, a glimpse of what God's doing. God was not doing that anymore. God was coming close to people in Jesus, meeting people, calling people, identifying people as individuals. This is revolutionary. That's why Jesus says stuff like this. He says, if any of you has a sheep 
that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? He'll say this, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet one of them cannot fall to the ground outside of your father's care. Even the hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than sparrows. This is radical. This is Jesus saying, as big as God is, he is so concerned with you as individuals, he knows each of the number of hairs on your head. I don't know the number of hairs on my head. There's two of you I know the number of hairs on your head because the number is, that's it. That's why I know. Right? I don't have a clue about that. Jesus is trying to give a picture of a God who is so intimately involved, so concerned with individuals, that even the amount of hair on your head, he knows. This is revolutionary, that everyone, unique, distinct, is loved and valued by God. And, and I, let me just set a pause and step out of the sermon for a sec. Because you need to understand, if you trace you know, the development of culture and the development of Western culture, this idea that was first promoted by Jesus becomes a thing that obliterates any idea of class or caste. Every society up until this point had, a, had structured itself with the haves and the have-nots, the ins and the outs, the special, the ordinary. And Jesus is blowing that all up. And he's saying, that's not the way it is. And so the fact that our democratic, independent, individualistic Western culture finds its roots in the words of Jesus. That's where it comes from. Okay, back into the sermon. He says, Peter, you are rock. And I, the God of the universe, will use you, will work with you to build my church. Now, if I put myself in the story, and I'm honest, which is not always easy for me to do, but if I'm honest with myself, and I'm in the story and I'm Peter, if Jesus just calls me the rock, <laughs> uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Like, I'm like... Can you say that a little bit louder? And making sure that these, you know, schleps behind me heard what Jesus said. My chest is getting a little bit bigger. My, my shoulders are being pulled back. I'm walking with a little bit more of a strut. Because, because God has just affirmed something on me that is actually going to let me loom even larger in my own mind than I already do right now. And this is where the truth that God values me, the truth of our individualism, the truth of our value and our dignity before God actually has a, a shadow side. You see, the same truth that elevates each one of us before God can also unleash something dark and destructive in us, and it's called pride. It's called pride. And nothing can bury the human heart more thoroughly than pride. And that is why there is no vice in all the scripture that is more frequently, more fervently, or more eloquently condemned than pride. Pride takes this beautiful truth that we actually loom large in God's eyes and it mutates it so that we loom even larger in our own eyes than God himself. Did you hear what I just said? Pride takes this incredible truth, the individualism that we all have, that we all uniquely matter to God, that we all uniquely loom large in His eyes. It takes that truth and mutates it till we loom larger in our own eyes than God Himself. And I know that's true because that's exactly what's going to happen to Peter. Because Jesus just said, you're the rock. He just affirms him. He affirms his uniqueness, his confidence, his calling, his blessing, his love, his affirmation. And four verses later, count them, one, two, three, four. Four verses later, when Jesus is going to tell him, give him some insight into what's coming, that he's going to the cross, Peter rebukes Jesus and says, not a chance. Not on my watch. What's happening? Peter thinks he knows better than Jesus. Peter thinks he sees clearer than Jesus. Peter looms larger in his own mind than Jesus does. And what is that? That's, that's, that's pride. And so Peter says 
Jesus says to Peter, <laughs> which took all that puffing up and just totally deflated him right here in one sentence. He says, get behind me, Satan. You have become a stumbling block. The word is scandalon. It means a stumbling stone. It means a stone in the road that you trip over. You have become a stumbling stone to me. Peter, I've affirmed your individuality as a rock. But if you give in to your self-enlarging tendencies, it will undo everything that I have for you. You won't be the rock. You'll be a stumbling stone. This is the fault line. These are two futures. These are two different directions that your life can go. And the choice is yours. Will you be a rock? Will you be a stumbling stone? Will your individuality be defined by God or defined by you? Will you serve my purposes for your life? Or will your life choices trip up my purposes? And just in case we think that this is only for Peter... Next verse, Jesus turns to the disciples and says this, if anyone, okay, anyone, anyone, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and my purposes will find it. And there is the fault line for Peter, and there is the fault line, the choice for all of us. Will this incredible momentum and power I find in myself to define myself by myself, to lift myself up, to have a life that makes me loom large in my life, will that shape my life? Or will Jesus' words say, no, 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 that will cause you to lose your life. The only way that you find it is to deny, to lose your life. Ah, oh, that feels like death. It feels like death. How does the cross rise up in your life? How is it elevated? How is the self, the big, bold me, subsumed under God's purposes? It's by denying myself, Jesus says. Now, Jesus' words come in the context of community. Right? Let's come back to Peter. Peter, I want you to give your life to build up my church. I want you to be about others. I want you to invest in others. I want you to make much of them. I want you to lift them up. That is how you will be a rock. And here is the truth that Jesus knows that we need to grab hold of. Is that when we open our lives up for the service of others, for the good of others, we will su be surprised to find that it actually doesn't diminish ourself. We become more of our self. We unexpectedly discover that we become more of ourselves when we focus more on others. Now that's the opposite of what our reflexes are. It's the opposite of what our individualistic culture tells us. This is the exact place where those two tectonic plates of self and Jesus' picture of self are crashing. But Jesus knows what he's talking about. And parents, you know that Jesus knows what he's talking about. I want you to think back um, to before you had kids. Right? When life was all about you. All your money was for you. All your time was for you. You could sleep in if you wanted. You could eat cereal for supper if you wanted. You could, really, all the decisions were made by you. You loom large, right? Some of you worn out moms and dads are like, this sounds awesome, but stick with me. Here, like, stick with me, <laughs> right? And then, one day you're at the hospital and the doctor hands you this little pink, wiggling little bundle of life. And at this moment, you realize that your life is suddenly about more than you. That suddenly there's, there's somebody else that you're meant to care for and look after and invest in and pour yourself into. Now, do you remember that moment? Do you remember when you first held them? I do. And it was emotional and was overwhelming. But let me ask you the question. When you went home at the end of, you know, day one as a parent, when you have this little life given that you have to invest in, did you feel like you lost yourself? Did you feel like you were somehow diminished? 
Or did you feel like you just discovered a whole other part of yourself? Did you feel like you're, you just swelled up more? Of course you did. Because when you live your life for only you, you become smaller. That's what Jesus is saying. Peter, if you want to gain your life, deny yourself. And denying yourself will mean building up my church. You're going to be all about others. Jesus is going to reinforce this to Peter over and over and over again because he's as thick in the head as we are. In fact, after Jesus is resurrected and he meets Peter and they're having breakfast of fish on the beach together and Peter's a little bit sheepish and Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And what does Jesus say? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And you see, this isn't just a command that Jesus is giving so that Peter will love Jesus more. This is a, a command Jesus is giving because Peter, because Jesus loves Peter. Because Jesus knows the way that Peter will fully come alive and fully be about himself is if he pushes down that inward self-centered tendency and makes his life about others. That's what Jesus knows. And Peter didn't get it at first, and it took him some time, but eventually he did. In fact, this truth so shaped his life that when he's an old man, and he gets to write a letter to some Christians like you and I, who, who are trying to walk the same path that he walked, he says these words. This is what the rock writes. He says, you are like living sto stones. You're little rocks. You're just like me. You're just like me. You have the same potential that Jesus gave me. You have the same calling that Jesus gave me. You are little rocks being built together into a spiritual house in which Christ himself is the cornerstone. Each rock unique and distinct. But you and I in our unique and distinctiveness are meant to be fit together. That's where we find ourselves, not alone on our own, but when we are together, when we deny ourselves and allow ourselves to be built into community. And that only happens, that only happens when we are willing to lay down our guard and be vulnerable and be real and resist that powerful impulse in me that says I must always and only project strength. I must always and only show those parts of me that are polished. You see, that's part of denying ourselves. Denying ourselves means we admit our sin, we admit our brokenness, we're vulnerable about who we are. And that's why in the same letter, Peter is going to say these words. He's going to say, clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Don't be like me. Don't let the calling of Jesus let you loom larger in your own mind. Don't go to a place of pride. Clothe yourself in humility towards one another. See, pride fixates on the elevation of self that will only let others see those parts of ourselves that we like, we want them to see. But the truth is, that's not who you really are. You're not your social media profile. You're not. You're not just the best parts of you. You're not. You're your brilliant parts and your blemishes. You're your strengths and your weaknesses. You're those polished parts and you're those, you are those parts that still need to be polished. That's who you are. That's the real you. See, our strengths will impress people for a while, but here's the deal. We connect with people through our weakness. Is that not true? Sweet, that's where the, the, the place of contact where, where two living stones are fused together is the place of weakness, not the place of strength. It's those parts that we try to hide that are often the contact points that brings two living stones together. I, I saw this again firsthand a few months ago. We were away at a conference in Calgary. And there was a teacher who was getting up and he was speaking and teaching and, and I was struggling with what he was saying. I was struggling with what he was saying because what he was saying was exposing a whole bunch of insecurities in me. And what he was saying was make me really start to feel like, man, I, I don't, I'm not much of a leader. And I'm certainly not a leader of leaders like I have to be here. In fact, I became so overwhelmed and I was kind of like 
feeling like, oh, I, I, just, like, I don't want to think about this because it's exposing parts of myself I don't want to look at, that I actually got up out of, the, out of the auditorium and I went out into the foyer. I was emotionally overwhelmed, surprise. And I, I bump into Chris out there. And Chris says, how you doing? In that way that Chris does that just makes all your guards just drop down, right? And I, I began to tear up and I remember saying to him, like, I, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can do what he's saying. And there's, there's too much at stake. And, and, and if, I, if I fall, the consequences are too great. And at that point, when I'm being real and vulnerable with Chris, Chris could be like, mental note, get another pastoral mentor. Right? He could have went that way, but he didn't. What, what, did, what did he do? He met me at my place of vulnerability. And he gets all teary-eyed too, and he embraces me in a dude way and and he speaks words of affirmation and love and encouragement and grace and and like our two living stones were cemented closer together that day not because I was projecting my strength but because I was projecting my vulnerability my weakness and another brother met me there and and began to polish that area so that's what Peter says. This is, this is how you become yourself. You are living stones clothed in humility that God will fit together. But God cannot fit proud stones together. They're like two magnets that will just, they're, they're, they're both looming so large in each other's mind that there's no place for them to come together. And hence, you've got a universal church filled with Christians doing their own thing. Because they loom larger in their mind than Jesus' words do. So let me ask you a question. Who in your life are you open and honest with? Like who knows the real you? And it, may, it might be your spouse, but I'm thinking beyond your spouse because your spouse knows the real you whether you want them to know it or not. I mean somebody who you are willingly let in to know the real you. You see, vulnerability like that, it feels like death. It goes against all of our reflexes for self-protection and self-exaltation, but it is the pathway to real life. So I would encourage you. I would encourage you in your next step in walking with Jesus, if you do not have a practice of confession, to find somebody who you can trust, who you know the Spirit of God is in, and begin to open yourself up. Begin to reveal more of who you really are. I don't care what age you are. I don't care whether you're 70 and you think, oh, I, I've, I've been down this road and I am who I am. Listen, the older we get, as our influence and effectiveness grows, so will pride. And that impulse to protect ourselves will get stronger and stronger because there's more to lose. And that's what I love about Peter. Let me end with this. Do you know Peter? At the end of his life, Peter had a disciple. Anybody know who his disciple was? This guy named Mark. Mark who wrote the first gospel. Well, Mark wrote the gospel because Peter told him the story. So, so really, Mark is a Peter's scribe. So when you read the gospel of Mark, you're reading what Peter is remembered, what Peter is highlighting, what Peter wants known. And so it is incredible, not just what you find in Mark, but what is not there. Peter said to Mark, hey, remember I told you that story when Jesus was walking on the water and everybody was afraid? And I was the only one who had the faith to put my feet over the side and I stood up. And I was the only non-God person to ever walk on water. You remember that story? Don't put that one in there. It, it makes me look like a hero. Put that story in there where Jesus rebuked me and called me Satan. Put that one in there. You tell that story. Tell the story about about when Jesus on his last night that he was alive, when he was at his emotional and spiritual breaking point, when he comes to me and pleads with me to pray for him for an hour. And I couldn't do it. And Jesus comes with blood dripping down. He says, Peter, you couldn't even pray an hour. 
Tell them that story. Tell them the story about the little servant girl. After I had boasted to everybody that I would never leave Jesus, asked me if I even know him. And I wet my pants and said, no, I don't. Over and over again. Tell that story. Because I'm not the hero of my story. The one who denied himself and took up his cross and gave his life for all the times where I denied him, he is the hero. And what happened to Peter? The resurrection power of Jesus unleashed through the Spirit of God and unleashed in the community of the resurrected began to shape and chisel and mold Peter that he indeed became the rock that Jesus saw in him. Because at that fault line of self, where Peter had the same choice that you and I have, are you going to loom large? Is your life going to be all about making you more and lifting you higher? Or will you deny yourself and lose yourself in order to find your life? Peter says, it's true, guys. It's true. Let's pray. God, it is a paradigm-changing truth to, to know and understand and believe that the God of the universe, the God that is bigger than any microscope can go, the God that is in the details as small as, I mean, as bigger than any telescope can go, a, a God that's in the details as small as any microscope can go, knows, cares, values, calls us as individuals. That's why Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's, it's an incredible truth that you love us and value us and hold us up as individuals, that we loom large in your eyes. But, but Jesus, that truth runs smack into this incredible power I feel in myself to loom large my own, to make my life all about me, that I have the stubborn reflex to think of myself first, that when temptation comes, I'm never, never tempted to be selfless. I'm never tempted to write a check and give somebody in need $5,000. I'm never tempted that way. I am tempted to be selfish. And so I need your grace. I need your patience, and so do my friends here, and so did Peter. Thank you that you believe that your gospel is powerful enough to take self-absorbed, self-obsessed people like us and, and, and live in, enliven our minds and invigorate our spirit to give us a new vision of life where we actually can deny ourselves and lay down our life and invest in the good of others, your church. Jesus, I, I pray for those here that, that have spent their whole life just trying to, to be the best PR person for themselves as they can be. I pray that you give them the courage to find somebody and take those steps towards openness and vulnerability. And I pray that they would be met with the grace and love and encouragement and fellowship that your scripture commands us to give one another so that lives in this room, in this church, would truly be little rocks fused together with you as our chief cornerstone. And at the end of it all, we could look back over our lives and say, and say it's true. When when we gave up of ourselves, we didn't lose ourselves. We found Jesus' life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for listening.